world to know, what Christmas is all about, that God gave His Son, Jesus Christ, for the sins of this world. And it's an incredible gift. And so you think, well, God doesn't really mean that much? He means everything in the world.
number 714, entitled Education. Um, and I chose this, I'm going to say another word, um, and I'm going to stop talking. But, uh, I, you know, I chose this because today, especially, um, this day and age, and even in our schools, even our children, we're hearing a lot of things. We're hearing that right is wrong and wrong is right. And our kids are being taught that things that the Bible say are wrong or right. Um, and that if you disagree, then you're hateful and you're intolerant. And we know that that's not true. And so education and knowing the Bible and following it is so important, especially today. So I will uh, begin in the regular type, if you would please respond with me in full. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith, the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. It was He who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word, mouth, or by letter. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Grow with grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the Lord, both now and forever. Amen.
Glad you made it out. Stephanie, I gotta tell you, brought back memories. Uh, it is well. Oh, by the way, you guys did not need me for that song. You did very well, thank you. Um, back in college, I took a course called Bible Approach to Song Leading. And our final exam was to lead this song in front of a group of our peers. Unbeknownst to me during my final exam, because we were supposed to be able to remain our poise, have our poise under pressure, they, they had worked it out with the instructor as he played the piano and I started to lead the song. They all closed their songbooks, put them, and walked out the door. And I'm standing there all by myself being judged. And, and the song leader, or the, uh, the professor, by the way, he pronounced it, it is swell. It is swell with my soul. So anyways, uh, it always brings back memories. Um, Travis, thank you for talking about uh, outreach. Uh, I'm hearing that prescriptions for depression are at an all-time high. There's a lot of depression out there. There's a lot of hopelessness out there. But see, we have a blessed hope. We can talk to people that we see in our everyday lives. And when we smile and say, oh yeah, yeah, the scripture tells us that this will be a sign of the Lord's coming. Can I tell you about that? Can I share that with you? That the Lord is coming back to take his people out of this wicked world as it was in the days of Noah. The earth was filled with violence. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. But we have a wonderful message. This morning we're going to concentrate on making sure that we don't let that message stray from what it should be. Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are following a different gospel. Not that there really is another gospel, that there are some who are disturbing you and wanting to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be condemned to hell. Now if the Bible says something once, it's important. That's verse eight, verse nine. As we have said before, and now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you receive, let him be condemned to hell. Let's pray. Now, Lord, pray that you would take these words. We pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive them as a message from you. Not my words, Lord, but your words. In your name we ask. Amen. Have you ever been shocked, surprised, confounded, speechless? Paul says, I am astonished. Your NIV Bible also translates that as astonished. Different translations render it as this. I marvel. I'm astonished and extremely irritated. I am surprised and astonished. I'm amazed. I'm astounded. I'm shocked. The message expands a little bit, as it always does. I can't believe your fickleness. How easy, how easy you have turned a traitor to him that called you. And then another translation, I am stunned. There's a term in the United, comes from the United Kingdom, and it's called gobsmacked. Gobsmacked. And the, the synonyms are all the words we just read. Irish, Scottish, I'm told the word for mouth is gob. So gobsmacked is, you were so shocked, so surprised, so uh, that I'm slapping my mouth in disbelief. So in today's language, I am gobsmacked that you are turning your back on Jesus 
and following a strange gospel. Paul is incredulous that they are forsaking the truth to embrace fake news. There are a lot of counterfeits in this world. God creates, Satan counterfeits. I have a friend that wanted a Rolex President watch. To him it was a sign of success. To me it was a colossal waste of money because like many luxury items, there simply isn't a one-to-one -one correlation with the dollar spent and the quality received or performance. October 1968, guys will remember this, Steve McQueen movie, The Bullet, Bullet, and that was released and the chase scene with the green Mustang, most of those guys can see it happening, going up over those streets in San Francisco, that has been called the greatest chase scene ever recorded, and it was recorded without cameras or without computers and stuntmen, Steve McQueen was his own stuntman, he was doing the driving, and most of that was done in one take. The only time they stopped was re to repair the car and get it going again. Several years ago, Judy and I went to the uh, Southern Baptist Convention, and I'm walking through the aisles, and there's Bibles on this side, and T-shirts on this side, all manner of Jesus junk and sacred stuff, and I come around in the corner, and boom! The green bullet Mustang. I mean, it was there. They had had to open several, that was a full live Mustang. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. I'm a car guy for what? That You gotta be kidding me. I thought that was lost. And the guy was a little bit sheepish and he said, well, it still is, this is a clone. Because, and they were selling, I don't know, some men's Bible study curriculum or something like that. And they thought it would draw some attention from the guys and Yes, yes, it, it did. A lot of guys, a lot of pastors have their picture taken with a green Mustang there. And I just, I just, you know, I was able to touch it. I was able to, to be right next to it. Now, it had been estimated that the original Bullet Mustang, Steve McQueen, a movie, the Mustang from the movie, that it could bring five to eight million dollars at auction because it was such a classic. Now, this was a fake, this was a clone, this was a counterfeit. Um, the Bullet remake a few years later, if some of you guys are fans of classic car TV, um, the, the, the show Fast and Loud uh, in their 15th season, uh, the Gas Monkey Garage, just for, how many guys know about the Gas Monkey Garage? Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> Judy and I visited the Gas Monkey. I visited the Gas Monkey Garage when we were down there in Dallas. Anyway, they were they were called upon when the Bullet movie was going to be re-released in a more modern format. They were called upon to build this, and so season 15 goes through how they rebuilt this uh, Mustang to today's standards. But it was still a counterfeit. It was still. Counterfeit. So my friend got his Rolex watch. Now, in truth, there are, it's a mechanical watch, and there are mechanical watches that can that cost ten times more, and they're no more accurate than the Rolex watch. In fact, the Rolex watch, because it's a mechanical watch, doesn't keep that great a time. The watch, the Fitbit watch, that is tied to your phone and tied to a satellite is more accurate than a Rolex watch, which you can buy used for $10,000, or you can buy new for over $33,000. And the 15, 20, whatever dollar Fitbit you have on your wrist has better time and is more accurate. You can pick up a fake on the streets of New York City, Rolex, for as little as 20 bucks. Usually you check the spelling, and it's spelled Rolodex, 
which for you, some of some of you folks, a Rolodex is a little thing that you put in, on your desk with names and addresses. A roller index, Rolodex. And so if you have a Rolodex watch, you have a counterfeit, and you probably overpay at 20 bucks. You have a fake, you have a phony, you have a fraud. In the United States, now, uh, maybe this is worldwide, anyways. Counterfeit products in 2016, $500 billion industry. There are counterfeits out there, and there's the real thing. By the way, the genuine, real McCoy bullet Mustang was found. It was a garage find, barn find, uh, and it was bought. The car that was bought for $3,500, brand new in 19. 68 was sold at auction, I think last year, for $3.5 million. Now, Paul realized that the gospel in his group was being counterfeit, but passed as the real thing. After Paul returned to Antioch in Syria, he preached a message there, or he received a message there, a group of Pharisees from Jerusalem, that they were claiming authority, and they were adding to the gospel. They questioned Paul's authority as an apostle, and they were teaching the new believers they had to be circumcised, they had to follow the Old Testament dietary rules, and the ceremonial laws of Moses. In Acts, at the Jerusalem Council, they demanded the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses, Acts 15.5. They were promoting another gospel. But Paul emphatically wrote to the Galatians in uh, Galatians 5, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now, these new believers were confused about who and what to believe. What was real? What was distorted? What was factual? What was fake? What was genuine and what was counterfeit? Today when I see a newspaper or breaking news on the TV and I listen to it, I think, hmm, what if that really was true? I have become very cynical on anything I hear or see in mainstream media. Paul immediately asserts his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He would not been commissioned by a committee or appointed by a leader like Peter or James. His mission was given to him directly in an encounter with the risen Christ on the Damascus Road. He saw and heard from Jesus direct, and that is the genuine gospel that he proclaimed. Paul knows the gospel and his spiritual children's souls are at stake, so he begins his letter with the one we read. The text this morning, Galatians 1.3. He says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, the true gospel is a rescue mission. Jesus Christ willingly died on the cross in our place to take the penalty of our sins and to open the way to a relationship back to God. We're going to discover there was a counterfeit gospel being shot to the churches of Galatia, and Paul wasn't going to stand for it one minute. Now, we were talking the other night about the number. How many, Jerry, how many churches did you say were right? About 11. About 11 churches uh, all around us here. And the message that they preach is going to vary from pulpit to pulpit to pulpit. But if they cannot back it up in the old black book, it's another gospel. In 1965, Walter Martin published a book entitled Kingdom of the Cults. It was a textbook in my seminary training. Just like the Secret Service studies money and counterfeiting, Walter Martin studied the Bible and the religious groups that claimed to have found another Jesus, or the true Jesus. 
Walter Martin defines a cult as a group of people gathered about a specific person or a person's misinterpretation of the Bible. A number of groups, they print their own version of the scriptures. And they'll call them a Bible or they'll call them scripture. Now, many times those groups, their teachings may can say contain some considerable truths which have biblical support. There's one well-known group in this country. Uh, I will not mention the name to protect the guilty, but you would know it if I mentioned it. They claim to be followers of Jesus. But they also teach that God started as a man, just like you and I, but then God became a God. And that he impregnated Mary and had twin sons, Jesus and Lucifer. There are like 15 million of these adherents made out worldwide. Oh, it gets better. You can become a God and you can rule your own planet one day. But wait, there's more. How much better can it be that I become God and rule my own planet? There is an arrogant politician that every person here would recognize the name who follows this thunk. And the reason he's so arrogant, or a reason he's so arrogant, he thinks he's becoming a God. He thinks he's better than you and I because he's becoming a God and we're not. We worship God. He is God in his mind. Another well-known group, you know the name if I mentioned it, they deny the Trinity, they claim Jesus was a creation of God, and they deny his physical resurrection from the dead. Another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. As we have said before, and now I say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, let him be condemned to hell. Literally, let them burn in hell. Paul is not pulling any punches here. There are people who push a different Jesus, a different gospel, a different spirit than what's in the old black book. Three things for you and me. You get me kicked off there, John. Give me a jump start. Beware of any message. I wonder. Pushing the wrong button. Beware of any message that undermines the fear of God. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance, nor make a decision based on hearsay. I often hear people explain the fear of the Lord as a mere respect or reverence. It has that connotation there. I was taught to respect and obey the lawful instructions of law enforcement because, well, they have firearms, they have handcuffs, and they can put me up in a room at the Gray Bar Hotel. <laughs> so I listen to their lawful orders and I obey. I respect judges if I'm ever in a courtroom situation because they have Although they don't have a gun, they have a person at their disposal who has a gun, and that person has handcuffs, and that person has the keys to the Gray Bar Hotel where I can spend a few nights if I don't watch my mouth and my attitude. The Bible uses the word fear at least 300 times in direct reference to God. So we make a mistake when we ignore it or we downplay it. Scripture is full of examples of how fearing God is a positive rather than a negative thing. For example, Genesis 42, 18, Joseph wins his brother's trust when he declares to them that he is a God-fearing man. 
The midwives feared God and they obeyed him rather than the authorities, sparing the Hebrew babies. Exodus 1.17. Pharaoh brought disaster on his nation because he did not fear God, Exodus 9. Moses chose leaders to help him on the basis that they feared God and wouldn't take bribes, Exodus 18. Moses told the Hebrews that God met with them in a terrifying display of his power so that they wouldn't sin, Exodus 20. The Mosaic Law cites fear of God as a reason to treat the disabled and the elderly well, Leviticus 19. Unless you think it's only the Old Testament, note that Jesus states this stronger than anyone when he says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And Paul said to work toward complete holiness because we fear God, 2 Corinthians 7. So, it's clear from these passages that fearing God is good because it saves us from caving into our own sinful nature. That's why hearing someone is God-fearing might make us trust them a little bit more than otherwise. If they fear God, they are more likely to keep their word and treat others with kindness. In fact, Romans 3, classic chapter on sin, says that our chief sin is that we have no fear of God at all, Romans 3.18. Now, all false teachers have one message in common. Relax, God's a God of love. God won't send anybody to hell. He won't hurt you. He loves you. A loving God wants you to enjoy life and everything that it has. There are blessings and there are curses in the scripture. God is quite, I set before you a blessing and a curse. Choose. And we choose. See, here's the thing. Your tithing or not tithing isn't going to affect my life one bit. Your improper relationship will not change my life one bit. Your obedience or lack of it, your fear of God or lack of fear of God will not change my life one bit, but it will surely have an impact on you and your family and your future. I mean, talk about tithing, the Bible does say God loves a cheerful giver. I can say with pretty a lot of confidence that, that he accepts money from crabby givers too. <laughs> He doesn't require that you cheerful. He requires that you give. But that's between you and your God. Hopefully another Jesus is not your God. All false doctrine has one aim, and that's to undermine the fear of God in you. We have an entire generation totally devoid of any fear of God. They've never known anything about judgment. They've always had everything they wanted, and they've not been taught the consequences of their actions. There was a meme going around the other day, uh, a young uh, white woman who had just been grabbed and was being carried away by law enforcement, and the look of terror on her face because in all probability, it's the first time in her life she will ever face the consequences of her actions. Laura Ingram the other night uh, portrayed uh, six people that are very active in the uh, burn, loot, and murder group. And they are all privileged white kids with very wealthy parents but they're burning and looting stores. These are all out of New York City, but the numbers, that uh, they've been catching them in Portland and California too. Wealthy families, kids that have never been responsible for their own actions. They always got a participation trophy and they were never told no. Spoiled, rich brats. They've never known God's fear. They don't even know fear of their parents. They don't know fear of law enforcement because they've been coddled and catered to. They think God is a great appeaser in the sky. 
Only a handful of Christian youth today walk in holiness. Why? Well, many pastors are too weak to preach the true gospel in the pulpit. Too many parents are living double lives, and their kids see it, and their kids know it. Now, there, there are churches that push back on their pastors. Uh, Kevin, I don't know if you uh, knew it. I didn't know it until this week. I was reading Jonathan Edwards was kicked out of his own church because he was too harsh. James Dobson was fired from Focus on the Family because he was too conservative. Spoke out against the popular issues of the day. Pastor, why do you talk about drinking and drugging and sexual immorality so much? Oh, my hate and back and ears. I'm tired of hearing about it. Because the deacons and the pastor are the ones called to clean up the mess and clean it and, and to try and help the broken heart and the broken lives and the broken homes. The devil has no happy old people. Most old people you talk to, do you have any regrets? You bet I do. As disciples, you and I are called to tell people the good news that Jesus died to forgive their sins and lead us to a better life. Some people get offended at Bible truth and they find another church or they stop going altogether. I've known a number of people. I think of one guy in particular, faithful Sunday school teacher, and, and he even taught in the Bible college at the church. But the pastor spoke out on a, 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 a sin his daughter was involved in. He said, I'm never going back to that church again. I'm never going to any church again. Why? Because the pastor talked about a sin that's written in the Bible, and his daughter was, was uh, participating in that, and so he left the church altogether. <coughs> First, or Second Timothy. Four, one through four. They will turn away their ears from the truth and will seek out teachers to cater to their own lusts. God's word says, Fear the fear of the Lord. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. If Jesus himself walked in the fear and respect of the Father, how much more should you and I? Second thing, beware of the message, and we're going quickly here, that distracts you from following Jesus. Not all who sound religious are really godly people. They may refer to me as Lord, but still won't get to heaven. For the decisive question is whether they obey my Father in heaven. Paul warns that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. And there will be many false teachers. Not everyone who throws around the name of Jesus are preaching the true gospel. Some of them are preaching about another Jesus, about another gospel. Since Jesus paid for the penalty of sin, then effectively, sin is abolished. So some say, well, you can go out and do anything you want. Doesn't matter. That's not in the Bible I read. <laughs> One side says, if you sin, you can lose your salvation. That's not in the Bible that I read. The other extreme says, you can sin without worry. Not in the Bible that I read. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And finally, beware of a gospel that allows for unholy living. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must Turn away from wickedness. This is how all doctrine must be judged. Does it conform you to the likeness of Jesus Christ? Does it make you more like Jesus or less like Jesus? What did John Baptist say? He must increase, I must decrease. One popular minister, again, if I mentioned his name, you'd know it, never went to seminary, never wanted to be a minister. And he calls himself, considers himself a life coach. Okay, I have no problem with life coaches. I know some life coaches. Then stop meeting on Sunday morning and pretending you're a church. Be a life coach. 
I feel as Paul must have a heart-wrenching cry to warn God's people of what's coming. There are great theological wars ahead. The whole evangelical movement will be divided and is being divided into separate camps rallying behind their doctrines. As of 2018, there were 47,456 Southern Baptist churches. A loud but small percentage of those have decided to preach another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. Critical race theory, intersectionality, social justice, economic justice, reverse racism. You can abort your baby because it's inconvenient to have a baby around. You can loot and burn your city because someone else is more has a little bit more than you did. And Laura Ingram proved when she profiled those people that some are burning and looting just for the fun of it. And they're, they're, not, they're not robbing uh, Tiffany's in New York City because they need a loaf of bread. I don't shop at Tiffany's a lot, but they don't have loaves of bread there. Big business like the NFL will provide a convicted felon and rapist prominence while ignoring all of the brave first responders that lost their lives on 911. Another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. Make sure you know the real thing. And the way you know the real thing is you study it. You study to be approved of God. You dig into it. Oh, you know, but sometimes things don't always make sense. We, we learn on Monday night. Get excited when you see something that seems to conflict. Because when you dig into it, you're going to find a gem that you never knew existed there. God's word is holy. God's word is true. And God's word is sufficient to get you and I the absolute best life that we can have here on this earth. Let's all stand together and have a word of, in a song of invitation. If you need to do business with God, this is a good time just to say, Lord, show me where I'm, I'm show me where I'm off path here. If I have if you if you haven't had a healthy respect for God and what he can do to you in your life, this is a time to confess that as sin. Lord Help us to look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us to be learned enough that we can spot a counterfeit when it comes close to us. Help us to be gentle and kind for those that try and lead us astray, but to be firm with them that we will not be moved off of our faith. Be with us now in the remainder of the service. In your name we ask. Amen. Amen.
study is happening tomorrow. We have a ladies' Bible study happening this week. Uh, youth Bible study will start back up again on Tuesday night. And we'll have it on Tuesdays probably till the end of the year. Cool. Church Council will be Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, it will be here in the fellowship hall. If you do not feel comfortable attending, but you still want to attend, shoot me a text or whatever. I'll make sure you get a phone number to call in and we can all attend. Also, uh, as part of Operation Christmas Child, you can know the boxes available, the regular cardboard boxes. Debbie and Norma bought a couple cases of the plastic shoe box type, and I sat about half the case out of over and fell the across. It gives the kids that receive it the place to store their boxes. They don't understand. They're actually really good. Mm -hmm. Cross Life has been in our fellowship hall for a couple of weeks, starting in August. In early September with the uh, children and uh, Jessica helping out some more that we had. On Tuesdays and Thursdays they would have some of the uh, children and we got several in from the, from the community. Uh, they're going to start, what are going to call it? A recess. Re they're going to start a recess type thing on the 23rd of uh, September. It's on Wednesday from uh, 11 to 1. 11 to 1 o'clock. And it's to sort of help out the children that they're going to be you know, closeted at home trying to learn to get have a recess trying to get out. Yeah, so it's all mainly outdoor activities where they're playing, running, burning out the energy that they would have done at school. Yeah. Instead, they're sitting in front of them. It's a good thing. And we're, we're trying to invite anybody who wants to help them to contact John Michael.